All right, ladies and gentlemen, from the dark side into the bright, please help me welcome Mr. Kevin Mitnick. <laughs> Hey, Kevin. Hey, 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 take a great seat. To, great to be here. How do you feel about that when people introduce you from the dark side into the bright? I don't mind. I mean, is it uh, true? Well, I was, I was a black hat, you know, uh, many years ago, and now I'm a white hat. So I guess it's, it's an okay introduction. Actually, it was quite, quite funny when I uh, was in, in, in federal custody, the, um, the officials there labeled me the dark side hacker, and I don't know where they got that term, because I think they thought dark side hacking equals dark side hacker, who knows? I mean, you, uh, people talk about you and say you are a bad hacker turned good hacker, but you know, we've, we've been talking a lot now in preparation for today. I mean, you, you don't seem like the type of guy who wants to shut down the power grid all over North America. Well, you gotta figure out where I started. Um, I actually started in this hobby of phone freaking, and phone, phone freaking, and it was about exploring the telephone network, right? And this is the same hobby that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, Wozniak had back in the mid 70s. They built blue boxes, they sold them on Berkeley's campus. That's how they started Apple Computer, by the way. But I was interested in manipulating the telephone system to pull pranks on friends. And I used to like, for example, modify a friend's home telephone to a payphone, so whenever his parents tried to make a call and say, please deposit 25 cents. So I used to do these kind of pranks <laughs> and I wanted to get better at manipulating the telecom system more for exploration and for challenge. And I remember when I was in, uh, when I was in high school, a, a student who knew I was into this phone freaking stuff said, hey, Kevin, you might want to take a computer class because he just started it. You had to be a senior, but I was a junior at the time. And I met the instructor, he says, well, you can't come into class, you're not a senior. Um, and then my friend told, you know, was there, and he said, show Mr. Christ what you can do with the telephone. So I started showing all these hacks I can do with the phone, he says, I'm letting you in class. And the first programming assignment he gave the class was to write a Fortran program to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. And I thought that was boring. Like, that, that's too easy, right? So I figured I'd write a different program to steal the teacher's password. That's a cooler program. So when it came around time to hand in the homework, he goes, where's your Fibonacci assignment? And I didn't have it. And he goes, I stuck my neck out. I let you into class and you didn't even do the homework. And I said, well, I did a better, better program. I wrote a program and he goes, well, to do what? I go to steal your password. Isn't your password blah, blah, blah. And his face turned white. And he goes, how did you do that? And I showed him the code. It wasn't in Fortran, it was in actually what we call Basic Plus back then. And uh, he was so excited about the program, he put it all up on the chalkboard, showed the other students, and gave me a lot of attaboys. And he said, this is so cool. So back when I was in high school, hacking was cool and you were encouraged to do yeah, it. Yeah, that was the ethics. Yeah, I mean, yeah. let's talk about that. I mean, yeah. when you did that, the teacher actually put it up on the board and bragged about the student hacking. What, I mean, what would happen yeah. today if a student did that? <laughs> I think you'd go to the principal's office and they'd probably call the cops. Okay. So, yeah, I think it's a different world back then where hacking when I grew up was, you know, kind of the cool thing to do. And that's kind of the track that started me in this you know, direction of becoming the world's most wanted hacker at one point. You also spent some time, you, you were telling me, um, in dumpsters and trash bins. <laughs> yeah, Tell not looking for food, yeah. looking for information. Um, and one of the places you know, I used to go, and we used to be friends, uh, friends would go as well, is we'd go to Pacific Telephone. That was the phone company in Los Angeles, California. We'd look for discarded hardware and especially discarded manuals manuals and notes, passwords, and this type of thing that people would throw in the trash. And at one point, we found that, um, well, first of all, if you're ever doing dumpster diving and you pull a bag out of the <laughs> trash and you shake it, and it feels like liquid or has any paper towels inside, put it aside. You don't want to go through that bag. So anyway. Who comes up with these terms, by the way? Foam yeah. freaking and dumpster diving. Well, it's, it's known. Oh, it's like okay. known in the area of, uh, Okay. You know, this computer hacking uh, security and okay. stuff. So anyway, um, we found that in a smaller trash bag that somebody went through the trouble of ripping up a document in tiny bits of paper, it looked like confetti, and 
we put it, we decided to take this, you know, glob of confetti over to a donut house, like a Starbucks almost, and we put it together over three hours and it was the entire username and password list to one of the phone company's most sensitive systems. Moral of the story, use a cross shredder, don't do it by hand. So even today, when I teach social engineering workshops, we go out and we get trash from like high tech areas of, you know, companies, mm. and we actually still find credentials, source code that's printed out, and still people throw away a lot of valuable information in the trash, even today, and I did that 30 years ago. You, you went to prison. Yes, As sir. a matter of fact, if, if the timeline's correct, it was 20 years ago this month, right, when you were the most wanted Correct. Computer criminal in the United right. States, right? And you were caught. Was it 20 years ago this week? Uh, right? February, Valentine's Day, 1995. Okay. So you're about, you're about right. Okay. So um, you, you went to prison. Did you have an epiphany while you were in prison or did, did something change that made you decide, okay, I'm going to come out of prison and I'm going to do what, what you do now. And that is you consult with, with businesses about how they can protect themselves from hackers. Well, I had no clue what I was going to do when I got out of prison because at the time the federal government treated, like, treated me like I was MacGyver. I mean, literally if I had a nine volt battery and duct tape that I could somehow, you know, launch a nuclear weapon. In fact, I was held in solitary confinement because a judge had told a prosecutor in court, when I was applying for bail, that not only do we have to hold Mr. Mitnick in jail, but we have to make sure he can't get access to a telephone or he could dial up into NORAD, into their modem, right. whistle into the phone and launch a nuclear weapon. So, but was the judge off, really off? Now, come no, on. I started laughing in court because I thought this guy was a total idiot and the judge <laughs> isn't going to believe anything he says. <clears throat> and the next words out of her mouth, he says, well, Mr. Weidman, I, 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 I think you're right. Mr. Mitnick is a national security threat, and we're going to have to make sure he doesn't get access to a phone, and I ended up in solitary confinement for a year. But you, yeah. did, you did tell us, Kevin, though, that there were times when you were hacking, and you actually got into the Pentagon, right? Pentagon files. No, that's a myth, but I did hack into the National Security Agency, but into the, the telephone system, NSA. Um, I didn't break into any and get, steal any NSA files or anything like that, but I wanted, you know, I wanted to climb Mount Everest, and I figured if I could wiretap the NSA, that would be cool. And by the way, I was 17 years old, and I did it from the high school computer lab. So what I worked out is because of my knowledge of the phone system at, at the time, I was able to access a telephone company switch in Laurel, Maryland, which handles Fort Meade, and I was able to set up a monitor number in that switch. And by the way, back then, it was just knowing the secret number to dial up. You didn't even need credentials. If you knew the number to the switch, you're right into it. So basically, I was able to set up a phone number, call into it, and it would just give me a weird tone. Then I can get on the switch and command it to connect to different trunks, and I could listen to conversations. So I was able to list out the trunk groups of the NSA's primary number, which is 301-688-6311. I still remember it. And then I actually started listening to a conversation. I go, oh man, that's so cool. After like 10 seconds and I just disconnected and never did it again, afraid that I'd get caught. But uh, yeah, so when I was 17, I wiretapped the wiretappers. Do you think you could today, you know, if you wanted to, you could get access to the NSA? Um, I don't know. Uh, to their public, uh, to their telephone network, the, on the, what they call the public switch telephone network, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, all I have to do is read Snowden files. I have instant access. Yes, right. <laughs> but, but as far as getting into, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know their security measures. I, I, I would assume that they would have the highest level of security measures possible. But then you look at the Snowden case and you have a guy inside the NSA who's able to basically copy everything onto drives and walk out the door. So it's really unknown. Let me ask I really you though, wonder. I mean, you are the world's most famous hacker. Is the NSA hacker proof? I don't think so. I mean, I, look what, you know, Ed Snowden was able to show that, you know, some guy inside could walk out with all their confidential files. I mean, I don't think anything's hacker proof. What to be you, honest with you. What did you think when you heard that the German Chancellor Angela Merkel's um, cell phone had been tapped? First thing I wanted to know was the make and model. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, was it a Nokia phone, was it an iPhone? Because I was curious of what type of exploit was used. I wasn't surprised at all, in the least. I was, um, I was thinking that that would be something that you know, the security, the spy agencies would do. They'd you know, try to wiretap each other. And 
Um, what I was more surprised is that it got out into the public. We've, we've talked um, all week about data security. You know data security is a big topic here in Germany as well, but also, yeah, that's what I do for a living. also yeah. around the world. Um, are we more threatened today than we have ever been in terms of having our data compromised, um, invaded, our, our identities stolen? Well, it's kind of a two-way street because back you know, in the 1990s when I was active as a black hat, you had to write your own tools and systems were less protected, people were less knowledgeable, less security aware. And today a lot of you know, people, now you have you know, kajillion companies developing security products, people are much more aware about security, uh, but now you have a lot more hacking tools available, a lot more people, a lot more, you know, uh, you know, sources in the community, tools, you know, open source tools, commercial tools. So it's kind of a balance, you know, but I, I have to tell you is when we're hired to break into our client systems, you know, whether it's physically, whether it's technically, whether it's using social engineering by manipulating the people, yeah. we get in 100%, 100% of the time. As long, the only time we don't is when they narrow the scope of the assessment down to like a few IP addresses and they only have us look at the network side, right. then maybe not, you know, then we don't have that success rate, I'm, but they say you can test our applications, you could try social engineering, you could try to hack our wireless network, we get it. That's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. And, and then when you look about these companies like Sony that get hacked all the time, it's like, it didn't have to be the, you know, I don't know if North Korea paid people to do it or, uh, you know, if it was a different group. But to me, I think it would be easy. The reason is, is Sony has a lot of, you know, different, um, you know, networks, you know, might be flat, meaning they, they might not do any type of network segmentation. Yeah. And uh, there's just too many, too many uh, vectors uh, and a lot of network real estate there, and I, I, I don't think they're a hard target at all. What, what do you think we should be more afraid of today? Should we be more afraid of state-sponsored hackers? We hear about a lot of that in China, in Russia, for example. Or should we be more afraid of, of people who are maybe the bad version of you? Uh, both. I think, I think we should you think be concerned about... The threat I think is we, equal? Well, I think, well I, I think the average person on the street really has to be concerned about the criminal, right? Uh, right. Or, or somebody that you know targets them, uh, but of course we're all victims of uh, government mass surveillance, right? So as I, I, you know, I mentioned, you know, I see all this stuff, people trying to change the government in the United States, people hemming and hawing, and I think it's a, to me it's a waste of time because I don't think the government's going to change. I think what the people need to do is start using the tools to encrypt their communications, okay. en encrypted email, encrypted uh, using encrypted voice VoIP apps to have encrypted conversations and encrypted text. I think people have to take their privacy into their own hands, use the tools that are out there properly, and if they use them properly, it makes it a lot more costly for an attacker to try to compromise those communications. Let's talk about the tools that we use. One that you'll find everywhere here are USB sticks, right? Right. They're everywhere, even at the conference. Well, even, yeah, everyone's heard of Stuxnet, right? right. So, um, so what should, you know, what should the audience know about USB? I'd be still careful of USB sticks because even though the security industry and Microsoft, for example, has, uh, you know, has advised people, you know, if you turn, you know, they, they turn off what they call auto run. So co code doesn't automatically run. They, they make it in the default configuration where if you plug in a USB stick, it's not going to work. But of course, as the industry figures out how to mitigate risk, yeah. there's always new and clever people that have figure out new ways to compromise. In fact, I'll show a quick demo with a Let's USB. Do it. Let's okay, do it. great. So, some of you may have heard this. This is actually this attack was actually discussed at Black Hat in Las Vegas, and this attack was actually developed by a guy named Karsten Knoll. He actually lives in Berlin, I believe. He's a brilliant researcher. And this is called the bad USB attack. And what this does is it exploits the flaw in the controller, in the controller firmware on the, on the USB. And I'm able to change this USB into an HID device to act as a keyboard to inject keystrokes to actually drop a malware payload. So I'm going to show you how this works. It's really easy. So first of all, let me go over to the Mac here. Passwords, Kevin123, in case anybody was curious. <laughs> <laughs> and people always ask me for my password. And then I'll change it to 1234 next month. Okay, so 
what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring up, let me make this larger. What you're looking at here is just what we call a Trojan listener. And basically, it's going to look for connections from compromised machines. It's a, it's a modified version of a tool called Dark Comment. And what it does is once a computer is infected, we're going to see it pop up here. And then we're going to see what control we have. And over here, we have a Windows 7 system. I just patched it last night, updated, um, uh, one, one second, updated um, McAfee antivirus. So it's the latest version of McAfee with the latest updates. And one second. So this is the typical system some target's going to have in their home environment. So if we could bring, um, comp uh, we could, I could, uh, yeah, that's a good one. So what we have here is the patch system. We have McAfee running down here. You see, uh, you'll see the little icon for McAfee. Fully patched Windows 7. So we're going to stick in the USB. And what I want you to do is pay attention to o up here on the attacker machine. This attacker machine is actually in London. It's not here. I'm uh, connected to it. And this machine is actually physically here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, plug in the USB stick. It's going to pop up. And, and how do you get people to plug in a USB stick? Here, I'm going to format it, by the way, make sure it's clean. And I'll, then we'll discuss how to get people to play, plug these things in. So we're going to format it. You found the stick. You know, you want to format it. It's clean. And then I want you to pay attention and watch, watch the Windows machine because I have it timed. Usually you time it when there's idle time, when nobody's around, when somebody goes to lunch, they leave their office, and it will inject the keystrokes to drop a payload from the Internet. So just keep watching this. It should be about 15 seconds. I said for 15 to 20 seconds, and it should pop up any second. There it goes. That's it. But that would happen, not immediately. Of course, when I'm doing this demo, I do it right here in front of you. And in a second, we should see the Trojan pop up here. Give it a second. Take, sometimes it takes 20 seconds. And it's a root-kitted Trojan. There it is. Right. So this machine isn't even in our building. This is in London. And this is, a, this is a piece of malware you don't want on your system. Basically, if we look at the functionality of this, it's nothing special. You could upload and download files. You could, example, you could look at stored passwords. Let me show you that really quick. You could modify the registry. You could, um, you could turn somebody's laptop into a room bug. So if they're using a laptop, you can enable the microphone, capture the audio files, and then transfer those audio files at any time. So essentially it becomes a room bug. Now there's a, a password there to VPN, CBIT rocks. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of small. Okay. And uh, the coolest one that I like, one of my favorites, uh, second is the spy functions, again, where you, this is webcam, so you can turn on somebody's webcam. In fact, one of the CBIT employees back there, there's only one guy that has tape over his webcam, so I had a laugh, right? He's <laughs> probably thinking of me. Right? So I turn on the webcam, and again, this is, you know, in London, so there's uh, probably gonna be some latency here. And over here, this light pops up, and here I am, hi. And you could basically use this malware essentially to do anything. <laughs> Physically watch the person, wiretap audio, upload and download other files, which could be other types of malware. You basically have full system control of the machine. You can basically upload a tool like Windows Credential Editor and get the person's passwords. It doesn't matter. But, but Kevin, isn't yes. this proof, though, that when you are camming for anything, even when you're doing FaceTime, you, someone, can, someone can be capturing that and you have no idea, right? Someone can be recording. That, you, exactly. Yeah. And they could be watching it in real time. So basically, this is something you don't want on your machine. And when we do a couple more demos today, we're going to install the same malware. I won't have to go through the functionality. But how do you get a target to plug in a USB stick? Do you leave it in the parking lot? Do you mail it in the post with some marketing material? No. You go to the company's Facebook account or, or, or wherever their, their website, you download their logo, and you put in red, uh, in red their company logo, 
extremely proprietary and confidential payroll salary history, second quarter 2015. <laughs> I promise you somebody will open it. But I gotta tell you, Germany, you guys are different. I was staying at the Marriott in Munich to speak at a different uh, conference, and I do this all the time. I'll go to the receptionist or the concierge, and I'll give them a USB stick, and I'll need them to print out my itinerary. So I hand it to the lady at the Marriott in, in Munich, and I say, can you print off something on here? And she goes, I'm sorry, sir. We're not gonna plug your USB drive into our computer. We're not allowed to do that. <laughs> so the only time I was ever turned down was in Germany. That's amazing, that's amazing. So this exploits a bug in the, control, in the firmware, which you cannot, there's no mitigation. Just don't plug it in. Okay. What, about, what about at work? We're told that PDF files are safe if we wanna, you know, if we wanna share documents, for example. How many of you open up PDF files in email? A few, right? And how do you trust it? You trust it because your company's antivirus product is supposed to scan it and ensure it's okay, right? So you kind of already trust it, and you probably look at who the sender is. Is that person in your circle of trust? Well, as an attacker, we know this. So we'll go out onto LinkedIn, we'll go out into other social networks, we'll identify who, who, who is in your circle of trust, and then we'll either set up another email account, email account, we'll try to spoof that domain, we'll set up a similar domain, right? And email you, purporting to come from somebody you trust, so you open up the document. Because social engineering is all about exploiting somebody's trust to exploit a client-side vulnerability in the software that resides on their desktop. That's, that's what social engineering is about. So we'll do this a little bit different. Well, we'll do it the same. How about that? So we have, put the Mac, if we can put the Mac up. Okay. So we have the same Trojan listener, same thing. And then we have on, if we could put the same PC up that we had on before. There we go. We have a file here called no malware here. So you can trust it. Just by the name, right? So what, well, we'll double check. We'll, we'll run the latest version of McAfee. And I'll tell you what, McAfee is good at one thing, making videos. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so we have here nothing found. And by the way, we could bypass any, AV is dead. I mean, AV is a critical um, tool that everyone needs to use because it finds the low-hanging fruit of malware but when we're doing security testing, we could bypass all AV products. That means the bad guys can. So unfortunately, AV isn't the uh, silver bullet that everybody needs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up this PDF file. And how this works, because it's exploiting a vulnerability in Adobe Acrobat, and it's doing, I don't know how many of you here are technical, it's doing what we call the heap spray. So it's spraying computer instructions over memory that I want to execute, and then it's going to try to jump to those instructions. And because of the way it does that, it freezes for a moment. So the user has that experience of a can't do anything for a few seconds, and then over here, the malware is installed. Same thing, same, same Trojan I showed you before. Same piece of code you don't want on your computer. So I'll go ahead and just un uninstall that, and that's with, uh, that's with PDFs. So, if you, unfortunately, I don't have a, uh, usually I do a, a keynote and I have a PowerPoint presentation and I offer the audience a free copy of it, but I only send it to you on PDF. <laughs> but nobody wants it. I don't get it. Maybe I have just bad, bad presentations. You know, yeah. um, I, I've read recently that um, your security testing team, that you guys are pretty good at um, hacking a building security so that you can physically break into uh, a company's building. Oh, we love doing that. In Germany, do you guys use HID cards? HID or access cards are called proximity cards to get into your office. I mean, it's a very, uh, well, in the United States, they have, in Canada, they have like a 95% market share, right? So what we do in our security testing is we also want to physically break into the client, right? So. I recently was hired to test a credit bureau. We have three in America. We have TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. You have a 33.3% chance of guessing it because I can't tell you because it's under NDA. So you can you know, try to guess. And one of our objectives in scope was to try to breach their data center. And how we're able to do it is by using the technology I'm gonna show you now to actually steal employee credentials off 
their proximity cards that are in their wallet, around their neck, or, or wherever on their body. So let me show you this. This is kind of cool. So let me bring up that app. <clears throat> One moment. I'll make it bigger so everybody can see. There we go. So, these are proximity cards. None of you have one because I'd like to use yours if you have one as part of my demo. You have one, you have a hit card, bring it on up. Now, you're, now you realize that if the data I'm gonna show everybody makes it ability to clone the card. Is that okay? <laughs> Hello? You speak English? <laughs> uh, I said, you realize when I put it up on the screen, people will be able to clone the card and become you, right? Are you sure? You don't care? Yeah. Where do you work? I don't have any. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll, make, we'll see if it's a low frequency card. Some of them are high. I am doing the demo on low frequency. We'll see if this is an I-Class or an I-Class Elite or the normal Prox card. So let's give it a shot. And you're sure it's HID, correct? It's HID technology? Okay, well, we'll see. So as he's looking, what I had to do to get into the Target's facility is use a device like this. Now, this is something you don't carry through Heathrow Airport security without disassembling. I learned that on the way to Germany. That looked really weird. What is that? <laughs> right? So what this is, this is an antenna. This is a, a Proxmark 3, and this is a battery pack, and I'm going to power it up. Second. <laughs> yes, TSA loves me. And I'm powering it up. And this is and anybody could buy this for 400 bucks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable it and weaponize it to steal card credentials. So right now it's weaponized. And normally I put it in a laptop bag because you don't walk around like this. Hi, I'm Kevin. Nice to meet you. And try to get it. You know, it's like, what is that, right? You put it in a little laptop, little, you know, in case, you know, pouch, right? I actually have one back there, but I'm not going to go get it. And this is what the hit card looks like. When you swipe the hit card, you get the card ID and the site ID. Once you have the card ID and the site ID, you can buy software to basically make a duplicate card. Duplicate card. When you duplicate it, you're now that person. Do you have the card? Oh, we'll try. Could be I. Well, let's look. That's right. No, it's I class. It's high frequency. There you go. I have those units, but I didn't bring it with me. Okay. He couldn't hack you. I couldn't hack this guy. Okay. Okay. So basically, if you get close enough to the victim, so I just get that close, and that's really easy because as you're going to the smoking area where people are smoking, as they're in line at the coffee shop, all you have to do with this device is get within two inches. Now, I basically stole the credentials on this device, and if I put it in play mode, this device is the same as this card. So I'll, I'll replay it so you can see the codes. It's the same thing. So this device is the same as ha having the card. But you're thinking, as you're listening to me, you're going, I would never let Kevin get that close to me. No way. Nobody's going to get that close to me. Well, I have a solution. So the solution is bigger device. So this device reads up to three feet away. <laughs> so you put this in a book bag. Now, of course, I open it. This is an antenna, so a Proxmark, uh, and I basically power that baby up. I have a micro SD card here. So as it reads cards, I'm not going to sit there and look at the display all day. It's going to note them for me, right? So let's put, the, if we can put the camera up here so I can... Well, you can see that. I'm kind of close. So you can see now, see, I read the card, 113, I don't know if you can see that, but basically this far away. How easy is it to get to a target? I recently did a test in New York in a retail shop. I basically had a book bag. I was able to get every employee in that store by just being three to four feet away from them and stealing it right, right from their pocket, so to speak. So once you have the card ID, and the facility code, which is the site ID, there's software and tools that you, anyone could buy to basically make a clone card. 
And this is how we were able to break into a major credit bureau was by cloning the cards and then going in after hours as the target and get access to their building. So this is I-Class low frequency. There's also I-Class elite, right? And there's I-Class standard. Those have been hacked as well. The only one that hasn't been hacked to date is the I-Class SE reader. But don't worry, by the next C-bit, we'll have it down. <laughs> okay. um, in Forbes magazine, give him a round of applause. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I remember reading in Forbes magazine recently that they said that you could steal anyone's identity in the US in what, three to five minutes? No, 30 to 60 seconds. Oh, okay. In fact, does anybody here live in the United States in the audience? Okay, we need, okay. A, we need, we need, a, we need a volunteer. Yeah. I'm going to try to get as much identity information about you. You have to be, live there in the U.S., preferably be a U.S. citizen, and not have a name like Bill Smith, Mike Wilson, something simple. And I'm going to see what information I can get about you in about 60 seconds. What was the question? Do you, do you, what was the question? You volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Come on stage. <laughs> you, go, you live in the United States? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, oh, I thought you said you do. Does that yeah. Yes. Who lives in the U.S.? You? No. You do? Okay. All right. There's one born every Now, is minute. it cool if I find any information about you? Can I put it up on the screen? All right, come on down. <laughs> I, I, live in the I, mean, I have a U.S. address, but I'm here visiting CBIT, right? So right, but you live in the States. That's where For is. how long? That's where I work. That's where I live. Oh, okay, great. Um, where do you, what state do you live in? Utah. Utah, Salt Lake? Salt Lake City. All right, all right. So let's try this data. Take my now, address what? and put it on the... Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. I'm going to show you, in the EU, you guys have much better privacy. In the United States, your private information is sold and there's a bunch of databases that private investigators have access to to get your private information. And I don't know, but I doubt it's available in the EU. But let's, uh, let's give it a shot. So I'm going to go to this database. I'm going to search on you. OK. I'm just going to search by name and state. We'll, we'll make it easy. So we know you're in Utah. What's your last name? Christensen. C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N. Oh. That's the end. <laughs> I'd never guess. And uh, first name, Ben, by chance? First name is actually Fleming. Ben is my middle name. Oh, Fleming, OK. I, I shouldn't have told you that. I should have had you hack it for me. There you go. <laughs> Fleming, is that correct? Two uh, M's. OK. Middle name, is, middle name is Benjamin. Let's see. Now, now, sometimes it doesn't pay off. Sometimes it does. But the beauty of it is if you want to steal some of these identity in the United States, it costs you only 50 cents. So what is that, about a, 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 quarter your, a quarter of your cents? OK, so we'll run the search. And again, it's not perfect. Oh, there we go. That one's me. Should I tell you which one's me? <laughs> well, let me guess. You're 28? Uh, yes, I'm 28. And your last four of your, your, your social security number is here, 647050732? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, yes. See, once you have a target's date of birth and social security number, it's game over. Then anyone could essentially, wow, you have a lot of people that are going to know your social, but it's <laughs> a lot of cameras clicking. <laughs> you're my friend, right? So uh, can... Well, no, I'm your friend. I don't know if these are your friends, but I'm your friend. But uh, the cell phone number yours, 801-953-8329, familiar or not? Uh, that's my college number, yes. Okay. So this is how easy it is. Well, thank you very much, by the wow. way, for being my victim. Thank you. This is how easy it is. You can go ahead, sit down. I'll give you, yeah, just put that down. So that's how easy it is to steal somebody's identity in America, but it even gets better. If you go to, you know, a lot of banks in the States verify who you are by your mother's maiden name. Can you believe it? And I'm going to show you something here. <clears throat> Hold on, what, Kevin, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> All right, just trying to remember my password, guys. One, two, three, yeah, the month. Okay, I got it. All right, so who played in Catch Me If You Can? Who played Frank Abagnale? Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio yeah. Let's see if we can get his mother's maiden name. 
So put in DiCaprio, we'll put in Leo, we'll just, for any that begins with Leo, we'll search on it. And if you see over here, you have his Leonardo W. DiCaprio, the actor, his mother's last name is Indiber. So that's pretty scary because a lot of credit card companies and um, financial institutions use this to authenticate you over the telephone. I hope that it's not the same in Europe. So it's good to be in Europe because your information is much more private than Leonardo's and uh, Fleming over here. Uh, Kevin, didn't did yeah. we talk about that too, the fact that um, in the States they do ask for more over the phone when you, when you do get a call center or you call your bank, they ask more on the phone and here that just doesn't happen as much. And we, 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 that was what you said was also an example of how in the EU data privacy is guarded better. Yeah, but if you're in the EU, I could still hack you by pretending to be like Deutsche Bank. Want to, want to see if I could do that? Okay, real try quick? to do Deutsche all right, Bank. All right, I'll, okay. try, to, all I'll right. try to be. By the way, we're not hacking Deutsche Bank for any law enforcement out there. This is just a demo. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear, I have to plug this in. This is going to take a moment. And what this is, this is called a Wi Fi pineapple. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I don't know if this is going to work. I had some problems with, it, problems with it because I had to go to a media market yesterday and buy this. Uh, device that I could tether, because there are certain types of device that allow me to tether to this, uh, this Wi-Fi pineapple. And what this pineapple has been weaponized is we wrote code to go out onto the internet and inject JavaScript. And what this does is it sits there and advertises an SSID. What's an SSID? A wireless access point name. This one is, uh, for example, if you're looking for an open wireless network, I don't know if you would actually join them in Germany, but they're very risky because when you join a wireless network that's open, an attacker could do what we call JavaScript injection. And we could inject JavaScript into the session, and this JavaScript demo I'm gonna show you will inject a fake Adobe Flash update. Once the person installs it, we'll gain full control over that victim's machine. So let's give it a shot. Okay, um, I'll just do it on this one. Oh, I, I'm gonna do it on this Mac instead. The reason being is uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be showing more demos on this one. So give me one second. Let me log in here. Let me move this over. Okay. I bought too many machines, but not enough connections. Okay. So, is this one up? All right. So this is a Mac OS X, fully patched, up to date, and I'm connected to a, uh, this wireless access point here that's open. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly weaponize this. Ah, how annoying. This is not the attack, by the way. Bye-bye, <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm gonna connect to it. And normally I'd weaponize it ahead of time and have it all running, but uh, I had to do some other testing, oops. Keep forgetting my passwords. Then I'm gonna run a script, and what the script does, it's gonna, it's gonna do what we call DNS spoofing. So when you look for a certain host name, it's gonna give a false one. So I'm gonna run that tool. And then I'm gonna connect again. So, give me one second, one second. Okay, and then over here, I'm gonna begin spoofing. Let that sit for one second. Then over here, we're gonna to connect to my attacker machine, which is here. Let me make that larger for you. Uh, say 130. So this is where hopefully we'll get what we call a shell, okay? So it's beginning spoofing, but it's taking a long time. Okay, finally it did it. And then what we're gonna do is bring up a browser and we're gonna connect to Deutsche Bank here that I saved. <laughs> and what happens is when you're connected to my wireless network, you could be, think you're going somewhere, but you're really not. So it's gonna load the bank's website. And then let's, let's wait a few moments. I set it for a 20 second delay. So in a 20 seconds, it's gonna inject into, jo it's gonna do a uh, JavaScript injection for the target to install Adobe Flash. And when they install it, it's gonna install Flash, but it's also gonna install my backdoor. Into the, there it is. 
Looks normal. Now, people get that update all the time. So let's go ahead. I'm the user. Ah, this damn update. So, okay, I better do it. I'm going to go ahead and install. It's going to go to Adobe Flash Player, right? But when you're on my wireless network, you never know where you're going. Let's go ahead and hit update now. It's doing the normal install. It's downloading a file here, the, uh, the DMG. And it tells you instructions that to install the Flash update in, in on a Mac machine, you have to open up the DMG. We're going to go ahead. We're going to open here. Try to make this bigger for you in case you can't see it. Ah. Where did it go? All right. Do it again. There it is. So what I want you to watch, this is the attacker machine here. Sitting, this is actually sitting in Los Angeles, okay? And once the victim goes ahead and just goes to go the first part of the install and clicks open, and it's signed by my developer account, so it's going to run, open, boom, right here. See this? That's a shell. That basically is a backdoor connection, like you know when you go to a DOS shell or a shell on your Mac. And now I have complete remote control. And then they could, could go ahead and hit open again and install. It will install the real Adobe Flash. We're not going to even bother. And then if we look over here, I'll make this bigger for you. And don't forget, right now I'm on the attacker machine that's not even in this room. Let's try to make, try to make the size so you can see everything. Go down. And this is a tool called Metasploit. So we're going to basically connect to session 11. And basically, if we do a W, which shows who's logged in, it's Kevin. So basically, I have a, a complete shell. And my next step would be to use tools to get administrative rights from on this computer that I was able to simply inject a fake Adobe Flash update by the user going to Deutsche Bank. So if you don't believe me, the access SSID name is CBIT2015. You're welcome to go ahead and install the update. <laughs> wow. So, you know, what a real attacker would do is they would do this. They would sit anywhere, and as you're connecting, they could, once, once JavaScript is injected, it lasts forever. You know, you, it's up to me when I want to make that expire. So this is a trick that people can do to trick people when they connect to the, the, to the wireless network of the attacker. So let's say you're, attack, you're connected to the real network, right, somewhere at a coffee shop. I could also send the authentication packets to the access point to force you off and trick your computer into connecting to my malicious pineapple and do the same thing. So I hope you understood that. Amazing. You know, you're in Germany, and you know the, the German Chancellor's cell phone, we talked about that earlier, um, it has been the focus of a lot of attention. Are there any cool tricks that you could show us with? Oh, you want to see a cell phone hack now? Cell phone. Yeah, I mean. OK, I need another victim. <laughs> OK, a German number is cool. Do I have any other victims here that have cell phones? Nobody volunteers with me because they know it's going to work. <laughs> what operator are you on? Oh, there's that woman again. <laughs> you don't know what operator? Look on the phone. Is it German? Kevin, she doesn't know where she lives. <laughs> 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 you have it? Anybody have a German phone here? And you're going to give me the number, right? Okay, what operator? Come on up, let's try it. All right. One second. Okay, so let me get some information. Uh, what's your... What's your number here? Four nine. I can't find it on my blog. It's okay. Uh, I can just get it easy <laughs> okay. from your mouth. Uh, zero one five one two two six nine eight two six two. That's a long number. Now, tell me somebody, a friend, or your girlfriend, your wife's their phone number. That's in your address book. Okay. Just find somebody. It could be your a boss. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't really care. Step up. Step over there for a second. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Is the Mac up? There you go. Okay. One five one. Two two six. Hope I'm getting this right. Nine eight two. Six two. That's your phone number, correct? Right up here. Yes. That's it, right? Okay, your German number. Okay, so give me a friend. Okay, four nine one seven two. Five one two. Six two eight three. Who's that? My girlfriend. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, phone. Here. Uh, if we could put the document camera up. Doc, uh, who's Marin? Is that your? That's my girlfriend. Let's see. Did she send you a message? I think she's coincidentally sent you a message. So you can open it up there. Yes. Oh. It's okay. Oh my God! <laughs> what are you, Kevin? What wait. are you putting on the screen? <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Did it come? It came up as Google. I don't know. I don't think so. That's from Kevin Mitnick. But that I would have never. They would have never sent that. Yeah, that's just a reminder for the thing. So you didn't get any text yet? No. Did I put in the right number? Let's check the number. Sometimes, let's double check. check it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. All right. Uh, was this it? Yeah, yes. That's it. Okay, we'll try it one more time. And your girlfriend, or your, what, what's the number of hers? Do you, do you see that? I don't know, maybe Vodafone uh, is not re uh, working here. Does anybody have like another uh, service like a telecom that we could try it on? I mean, we worked on Vodafone earlier today, so. Well, let's just try it again. What's your girlfriend's number? Is that it? Okay. Don't know it by heart? Give me your Give your phone number. Which of the last four? I'm not giving my number. Two, three. <laughs> Two, three? Yeah. I'll give him your number. What? Yeah. Oh, right here? You make more money. Yes? No. Okay, just give it to me. Is she on Vodafone too? A49. Does anybody have a telecom phone? By Nicole the way? does. Who does? Nicole. Nicole. Nicole, come on. Come on up here. Nicole. Let's try with Let's Nicole. Let's give Nicole a round of applause. Know. Oh, come on. All right, maybe. You. All right, Nicole, we'll try with yours. Look what happened to her last time she did this. <laughs> <laughs> Vodafone doesn't like me today. Well, again, this all depends on providers. So I know your number's in here. Which one is it? The 1146? That one. Okay. So who do you want to call? No. <laughs> What's your number? The girl right there. I'll, you're going to send her a text message. 49. <laughs> okay. Who, somebody on the front row. Give me a phone number. Uh, do you have somebody in your address list? Yes. Okay. 49. Which one? Um, oh, they called me so many people. Um, hang on. Okay. Um, that person. That one. Okay, four nine. Four nine is one, two, three, zero. Three, zero, six. six. Oh, we did that one. Okay. Perfect. Right. There we go. <laughs> now, put that up on there. Uh, but So we'll see the text message. Whose number is that? Want to see the text message? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but just put the phone like normal in there. Let's, and let's see if this works. All right, let's hope and pray. Sometimes it takes like 20 seconds or so. There we go. There, Brent, finally. So go ahead and open it up. And I'm obviously not Brent. Brent is on stage. <laughs> Please give Kevin all my passwords. <laughs> wow. All right, there we go. Thank you. That's good. Thanks. <laughs>
Did you, ever, did you ever get that message from Vodafone? Did you ever get it? I don't know why. So basically, what could you use that for? Well, if you're doing a social engineering attack, and what is social engineering? When you try to manipulate a human target into doing something that allows you into their network or their systems, is imagine, I don't know, a case where you know the CFO of a company is out on a, on a plane ride on the golf course, and you know the CFO's personal assistant cell phone number, you use SMS spoofing to text her or him a message. You know, when Kevin calls, go ahead and release the third quarter financials to him. And by the way, please don't text me or call me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the golf course, whatever. What are the chances that personal assistant is going to follow through with that request and not contact that person back? In the United States, the chances that she'll follow through are 99.9. .9. I don't know about Germany. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive Because stuff. people believe when you receive texts and phone calls, that the source is really the source. That's amazing. Right? Yeah. Any questions for Kevin? Um, we got a little bit of time before we go out and do a book signing event with Kevin. Any questions for him? I mean, I've got several, but any out here? I want, if you could, Kevin, maybe tell us about the type of companies that come to you now. Pretty much everything. I can show another demo if people want to see mean, another cool you, demo. You guys want to do another demo? Okay. And, and if you ever go to a website and it's, uh, you get a Java applet, you know, you get a Java applet and it pops up and it's signed by the company, usually like a Microsoft or an Apple or the bank or whatever. And then what people do is we'll decide whether or not they're going to run that Java applet by who signed it, right? And when I'm doing social engineering pen tests, this attack works 95% of the time in the United States. So let me show it to you real quick. We'll bring up the same machine with the same Trojan listener. Right here. And then if we could bring up, uh, oh, I gotta plug it in, Never mind. If we could bring up the Dell back online, hopefully. Uh, the other computer, which is uh, 11, I guess. There we go. So what we're gonna, we're gonna do is we're gonna bring up a browser. And in America, we have a, uh, like a big bank called Chase. Maybe it's like Deutsche Bank here. So I'm going to go to the bank, the link. And then what happens is when you go to the bank, it pops up with this Java applet. And JP Morgan Chase owns Chase, right? Now, as an audience that should know about technology, first of all, this is a real Java applet. Do you see what's wrong with it? Do you see anything wrong with this picture of why you wouldn't run that Java applet? Or does it look okay to you? Speak up, you can speak up. Well, one clue is it doesn't have SSL. I could have fixed that, but I'm doing it realistically like we would do in an attack. So if, if that is a clue, but does anybody see anything wrong with the Java applet? You know, it's Chase, JP Morgan Chase. Do you see anything wrong with that picture? What is it? There you go, publisher's name. A lot of people will be fooled thinking that J.P. Morgan Chase signed it, and they'll see verified secure applet. And what people will think this word's verified secure applet, that it means that the applet is actually secure. It isn't. What I did is I opened a company in Las Vegas called Verified Secure Applet and bought a code signing certificate for Java. So I could change this name to anything that I want, Microsoft, Apple, Citrix, Deutsche Bank, and this applet will pop up. Most people that aren't technically astute, talking about employees, not that aren't, you wouldn't target IT. You're talking about other departments within a business. What are the chances they're gonna execute that Java applet? Pretty high. Again, in the States, it's in the high 90 percentile. And what happens when you execute it? If you watch the Trojan listener that we have here, remember? We'll just run it. and it redirects to the real site and installs the Trojan. That doesn't require exploiting client-side software on the person's desktop. That only requires running the Java applet is, is, is almost like running an executable. And a lot of people are fooled into this attack because they think that the name is the signer and they trust it. And we use this a lot. Where did Brent go? I guess this is me. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll uninstall the Trojan. 
Want to see another attack where somebody opens up a Word document and you steal their password? Yes. You want to see that one? Okay, all right. So, to do this one a little bit different, okay. Go back to here. This is an easier attack, and this is, the reason this attack works is because a lot of companies are really good at setting up their incoming firewall rules but are really bad on their outgoing firewall rules. Usually consumers can't be attacked by this because your ISPs will block this. But let me go ahead and show you this. So over here, oh, I could use the same computer, no problem. So over here, we have the attacker machine, okay? Over here, the victim has a, has a non-disclosure agreement that I send out uh, in Word. And by the way, if you ever ask for my non-disclosure agreement, I promise I'll never send this one to you. Trust me. Now, I, uh, I'll send you a, a, a one that's not backward. So basically, if we check it for any type of threats through McAfee, <laughs> we'll see nothing's found. So it's going to bypass your firewall. And watch what happens is when I open up this document. Open up the document. Don't forget, this machine is not even in this room. This is in London right now. And if we look at this mutual non-disclosure agreement on the computer, there's nothing embedded, nothing that looks suspicious at all. It just looks like a typical, ordinary non-disclosure agreement. So what happened? What happened is, as soon as we opened up that document, we got a bunch of gibberish. What this is, is the hash version, the hash equivalent of the user's password. So this NT hash, because Windows doesn't send it in the clear, it sends it hashed. So what we have to do is simply crack the hash to get the user's password. So we'll go ahead and do that. We'll do a different shell script here. And we'll run the shell script. And wham, user is root, password is CBIT rocks. Wow. And see how this was done is companies that allow port 445 out you can embed stuff into Word documents that will basically send the credentials out. Well, the password, you know, the hash, it's usually easy to crack the hash. And then if they're using Juniper for VPN, it uses the user's domain account to authenticate. If they're using Microsoft's point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, you know, the same thing. So now you could VPN in, and now you're in on the internal network under a domain user account simply because that person opened up a Word doc. So that's an attack that works 60% of the time. It really depends on the firewall rules. Uh, we've got time for, have you got one more that you could do or? Well, let me think. Um, I have one that I weaponized, well, it's kind of old. Um, <clears throat> let's see, let's try with, uh, with Deutsche Bank again. Okay. Let me see if I can get somebody's like secret pin. Okay, so we're gonna close this up. Again, I can't promise you this will work, so we're, I want to make sure we're on the right computer. If we could put a... Sorry. If I could put this one on the line. Okay. All right. So I'll just minimize this. We're still connected, I think. Yep. So let's go back to Deutsche Bank. Where is it? Oh, here. Make it bigger. I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time on that uh, prepaid card. Oh. So I don't want to translate German, and I want to log in. So Kevin, ahead. while you're doing this, since you, since you say McAfee is not so good, I mean, who, who should we use then, or, or what should we use then to scan for well, bugs? Um, I'll tell you, when I'm doing pen testing, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to bypass Kaspersky. Right? But that's not to say we can't do it. If we spend more time, different AV products are harder to break. But pretty much assume that any attacker is going to be able to get uh, past the AV. Let's see if I, this is going to log in. Uh. I'm sorry, this uh, portable uh, wireless connection really sucks. Try to, oh, wait. Right again. 
Yeah, so that, that, unfortunately, that, that part is not going to work. Okay, well, that's, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Tell yeah. us again, and tell us, um, before we wrap up, tell us about the people who come to you now and, and want you to check their company. Oh, yeah, all I do it all the time. I do physical, technical, mm -hmm. and social engineering pen tests. We have extremely high success rate is because we're able to, we use the best people to do it. But I do have one story I'd like to share. Do we have time for a, a cool story? Sure. Okay. So think back, this is the year 1993. I'm gonna talk about the threat and impact of social engineering. And in 1993, I was living in Denver, Colorado. I was living under the name of Eric Weiss. That happens to be the real name of Harry Houdini. He was my idol. The reason I was living under that name is certain law enforcement agencies were looking for me at the time and I didn't want them to find me. Uh, so I thought I had a sense of humor of using Harry Houdini's real name. I found out that later that the FBI had no sense of humor. <laughs> Story for another day. So one of my colleagues at the law firm hands me this brochure for the Microtac Ultralight cell phone. And this was like, this is the Microtac. And this is the Star Trek communicator. This right. is like the iPhone 6 of the 1990s. Really? Remember these phones, right? And what I wanted to do is I wanted to get the source code for the firmware in the Microtac. Why? Because I was curious of how it worked. I was fascinated with technology and I wanted to understand the code. So I made a very stupid and regrettable decision to go after the code. So I was, living, I was working at a law firm that day because I was, uh, had a job and I asked my supervisor if I could leave a, a, earlier for a doctor appointment. And when I got to the bottom of the building, because it was on a skyscraper, I turned on my cell phone, which which also wasn't in my name, and I simply call 1-800-DIRECTORY service, directory information. I asked directory assistance for the phone number to Motorola. They give me a phone number, I call it. I get a receptionist and I say, hi, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech Ultralight. And the nice receptionist told me that all cellular phone development from Motorola is handled out of Schaumburg, Illinois. Then she goes, would you like their number? I said, sure. She gives me the number to Schaumburg, Illinois. I call that number. Uh, I get a different receptionist. I say, hey, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtac. I'm transferred to two, three, five. By the eighth or ninth time, I'm transferred around to various people. I'm now talking to the vice president of Motorola Motor Mobility. So the guy that was the vice president of R&D for all of Motorola. And I said the same thing. I said, hey, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. Because during those last transfers, people go, where are you, Arlington Heights? So I picked up on some information. And I said, hey, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtac. And the VP goes, oh, that's Pam. She works for me. Would you like her extension? I said, sure. He gave me the extension. And he goes, can I help you with anything? I go, no, no, no. I'll talk to Pam. So my next call was to Pam. I don't get her, but I get her outgoing reading on her voicemail that she just left on a two-week vacation, the date she was re returning, and if you need any help whatsoever, please call Alicia on extension blah, blah, blah. So who's my next call to? Alicia. I call Alicia, she answers. I go, hi, this is Rick over in Arling Arlington Heights in research and development. I go, did Pam leave on vacation yet? Oh, she has, because before she left, she said she was gonna send me the source code to the microtac but if she didn't have time, I can call you that you would help me out. And by this time, I'm pressing this, you know, but this is in the 90s, I'm pressing this, you know, big Motorola head, uh, uh, cell phone to my ear and I'm walking down the street. There are cars, you know, horns honking, it's snowing. And uh, I don't wanna, obviously I wanna, you know, appear that I'm coming from an office, not, you know, walking on the street. And I wasn't expecting the next question. She goes, well, what version do you want? And I didn't even look up the version numbers. <laughs> so I go, I go, I was trying to think quickly, and I go, how about the latest and the greatest? So I'm walking, and I'm about a 10-minute walk from my apartment, and I hear her typing and typing, and about five minutes later, she goes, I found it, you know? I go, but there's a problem, she says. I go, what's the problem? She goes, there are hundreds of directories, and within each directory, there are hundreds of files. I asked her, I go, do you know how to use tar and gzip? You know, that's like WinZip under Windows where you can archive everything. And she said, no. I said, would you like to learn? And she said, yes. And I became her instructor. 
And I taught her how to tar up all the source code. Then my next question to her is, do you know how to use FTP? And she goes, a file transfer program. I go, yes, that's it. So I gave her an IP address of a system I had access to because I couldn't give her a host like hacker at colorado.edu. <laughs> so she tries to open a connection up to the IP address I gave to her, and it just timed out. And she tried twice, three times. Then she goes, Rick, I'm going to talk to my security manager about what you're asking me to do. I'll be right back. And I go, no, wait, 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 wait. Because <laughs> that's the last person I wanted her to talk to, right? So I'm, again, like now five minutes from my apartment, and I'm, I'm kind of nervous now because she's taking a long time. And I'm worried that she's going to hook up a recorder to the, uh, to the call, and that's going to be exhibit A in a court case later. And I was a little bit nervous, so I decided I was going to play a little bit careful when she came back. So a long eight minutes later, she comes back, and she goes, Rick, uh-huh. She goes, that IP address you gave us is outside of Motorola's campus. Uh-huh. And my manager that I just spoke to said, we can't send files outside of Motorola unless we use a special proxy server and I don't have an account. And I go, uh-huh, and I'm about to hit end on the phone. And she goes, but I have great news for you. I go, what? She goes, my security manager gave me his personal username and password <laughs> to the proxy server so I could send you the file. <laughs> yes. So by the time I could put the key to the front door of my apartment, I had the crown jewels of the Microtech Ultralight. So Motorola, they're a great company. They develop technology. But I think it shows that a person on the other end with a good gift of gab could easily manipulate people and companies to give out information they shouldn't, especially their crown jewel source code for the Microtech. So that's, that's a great the story. story. Yeah, that's a great story. story. <clears throat> Kevin, well. If you had it to go back and, and do again, would you do anything different? Yeah, uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, 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 did, a lot, I did a lot of, uh, I would say, negative things that I regret. And, uh, you know, I hacked into a lot of systems, not because I was malicious. I was the type of hacker for the intellectual curiosity, the pursuit of knowledge, and the seduction of adventure. Yeah. I wasn't the guy to write viruses or try to profit from this type of activity, which has all changed today, by the way. Yeah. But I still caused a lot of trouble mm -hmm. for a lot of people, right? And because they didn't know who it was, you know, that was hacking into their systems. They probably thought it was a competitor stealing their trade secrets. So I caused, you know, I caused, you know, a lot of people to waste time and money. You know, and I got punished for it. And, what's, you know, and what I was able to do was take, take those lemons, squeeze them really hard with a lot of hard work to gain trust over all these years and create lemonade and take the skills right. that I've acquired over this long period of time to help companies protect themselves against the older Kevin Mitnicks of the world. You know?